Thank you so much, Sarah, for that really kind introduction. And thank you all for coming on such a dreary Halloween day. Um, and thanks to the festival for inviting me. It's a real pleasure um, and an honor for uh, scholars like me to emerge <laughs> from the ivory tower um, and, and speak a, a, at venues like this and events like this. It's really um, enriching to all of us and, and to our work. And I hope we can have a, a lively discussion during uh, Q&A afterwards. Uh, so, uh, you know, as, as Sarah mentioned, uh, my training and background is in the field of theater and performance studies. Um, so in my work, and I think it's just worth sort of talking for a second about what I mean by that, that term, performance. Um, so I approach performance as an event that can take place on stage, right? Plays, concert dance, right? Things that we can familiarly frame as performance, um, but as well as off stage, right? Performances of everyday life, the kinds of social roles that we play in the world, um, Halloween is a particularly good day <laughs> to think about performance, right? Because it involves all kinds of um, wishes and dreams and fears and fantasies, right? That are um, that that we that we take on momentarily in order to explore them. Um, so that's the way I'm sort of approaching some of this uh, historical material. So what I'd like to do uh, today is share some work uh, from this new project, rehearsing civil rights. Uh, and this is a book that thinks about performances both on stage uh, and off stage during uh, what I call the long civil rights movement. And of course, I did not invent that term. This comes um, from a scholar named Jacqueline Dowd Hall, um, who argues quite persuasively and others after her that um, to think about the civil rights movement as something that belongs solely to the 50s and 60s um, is in fact an error, right? And we can think of the civil rights movement as having a much longer history as part of the long struggle for black freedom. Uh, and we can talk about that a little bit more uh, during Q&A if you'd like. That said, most of my discussion today is going to focus on that 50s and 60s moment. So why rehearsing? Let's start there. So what historians call the classical phase of the civil rights movement, this is sort of the mid 50s to mid 60s moment, um, is filled with what we might call sort of the big events, right? These are the events that we learn about in school, the Greensboro sit-ins, the Freedom Rides, the Birmingham campaign, the Selma march. Um, and thinking about these events as performances makes a lot of intuitive sense to us, right? Um, because they were in fact uh, staged in a very self-conscious way. Um, and a big part of that uh, was the rise of television. And I need to turn on my thing. Anyway, um, so television, right, as, as a medium that is coming to the fore, um, you know, becoming widely popular um, in every home during this period, uh, and, and the rise of civil rights nonviolent direct action, um, these two things are inextricably intertwined, right? The fate of civil rights and the fate of television are, are sort of built into each other from the very beginning. And activists and organizers were extremely savvy about using this new medium of television to, um, to broadcast their struggle um, around the world and to create a kind of global solidarity um, through the medium of television. Ironically, these events were not often broadcast to the local constituencies where they were taking place because southern station managers often really exercised um, their uh, prerogative in, in blocking a lot of these news reports of events that were taking place. And so on the right here, this is not a great image, but um, these are two really interesting books on television and civil rights if you're interested. Um, Sasha Torres is black, white, and in color. Uh, and equal time, television and the civil rights movement. So, um, so we see, you know, this this idea of performance infusing these big events of the civil rights movement from the very beginning. And it won't surprise you um, to know that a lot of these big events uh, also had a lot of preparation involved, right? Behind the scenes preparation. If you saw the movie Selma you get a kind of glimpse into that preparation, the backroom negotiations and quarrels and institutional struggles that went on. Um, but there was also very often uh, an acting out, a very 
practical acting out or rehearsing of the scenario that was about to happen. Uh, and so this was a way of training people who were not professional activists um, in uh, what they were about to do. Uh, and so, you know, I think role playing, the idea of role playing, is such a dominant phenomenon today. And many of us have probably taken part in some role playing exercise, either willingly or unwillingly, right? It's sort of a <laughs> team building thing that we now do. And, corporate settings, but it's also used in uh, drama therapy exercises. Um, and it's so widespread, I think it's easy to forget that role playing does in fact have a history. And part of its history, very important part, is in the civil rights movement. Um, so one of the things I think a lot of the civil rights activists were thinking about role playing is not only that it could help prepare people for an event, in a very concrete way, but also that it could change the dynamic for the participants themselves. It could be a meaningful thing in and of itself to take part in that rehearsal. Um, the marginalized people who were preparing to take part in often very dangerous actions could imagine new realities for themselves. They didn't just talk about a new world, but they could momentarily embody it. Um, and they could live inside it and see momentarily, you know, what that emotional intensity of fear and courage was like, and also the practical steps it would take to get there. So, and they often call this the sociodrama. So sometimes I'll use that word sociodrama instead of rehearsal. But these are the these are the um, the rehearsals they took part in together. Um, and sometimes these were very fraught events. When I talk to people um, about these events. Um, I often get a lot of great stories, um, but also, you know, stories of times when the event, the rehearsal, the training session kind of fell apart. Um, people would get into arguments. Um, Role-playing violence would sometimes spill over into a kind of space where it didn't seem so fictional anymore, right? So, and this often happened when there were interracial groups of allies training together. So, for example, um, prior to the Freedom Summer in 1964, uh, a lot of volunteers uh, convened in Oxford, Ohio, before going to Mississippi, where a lot of these training sessions were run. Um, and uh, there were opportunities, um, and in fact, it was mandated that people participate in the sessions. And somebody has to play the white supremacist citizens council member, right? Somebody has to play the violent racist policeman. Uh, and, and you know, ostensibly nobody in that room wants to inhabit that role, um, and yet somebody had to play it. So, um, and then sometimes these moments of violence, right, where participants were being trained, this is how you fall down and don't hit your head on the ground. This is how you shield your body um, and protect your most vital organs if you're being beaten. Um, that these rehearsals of violence would sometimes spill over into very sort of real encounters that would then demand a lot of processing after the fact, right? What did that mean that you kind of got out of control in playing your role as the violent policeman? Um, and so, uh, and they were also used, I think, sometimes to determine the fitness of the volunteers um, whether they were able to inhabit the kind of physical, spiritual, emotional discipline uh, required of them um, to do what they were about to do, to work as a team, um, but also to access some of the fear. And some people I've talked to have said, you know, after I did that role-playing scenario, it wasn't for me. I realized I couldn't do it, right? The fear was too much. So it was also a kind of uh, weeding out <laughs> mechanism of training that would take place. So all of this reflection about rehearsal led me to another question. Um, and that question is, so what's being rehearsed exactly? <laughs> you know, there's a narrow answer to this question. Um, what's being rehearsed is how to fall down without hitting your head on the ground. Uh, but what's also being rehearsed um, is a new relationship to the law. And the best way that I can find to sum this up succinctly is to offer you this quotation from the jurist Charles Hamilton Houston. And Houston was Thurgood Marshall's mentor. He was the chief architect of many of the uh, groundbreaking cases that led up to Brown versus Board of Education. Um, so he's a generation older than Thurgood Marshall. 
Uh, and he said, nobody needs to explain to a Negro the difference between the law on the books and the law in action. And he said this in the mid-30s. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think these embodied rehearsals, these acting out of, uh, of scenarios of nonviolence are doing is really pushing people to think about the law in action and perhaps that discrepancy between the law in the books and the law in action in, say, 1963 Mississippi. And I think this is something that also speaks to our theme of citizen, right? That there's, uh, there's the dictionary definition of citizen and then there's the lived experience of citizenship, which is not equally applied to everyone who fits that dictionary definition, right? So thinking about how these things are embodied, enacted, is of great interest to me. So uh, today I'm gonna share three stories with you. Uh, this is why I, I subtitled the talk, Two People You Know and 80,000 People You've Never Heard Of. Uh, so <laughs> the first, you know, each story is about a performance of the law. Um, that rehearses a new relationship between black Southerners um, and their own citizenship, right? So in the story of Rosa Parks, first person that you've heard of, um, we see a planned performance of strategic law breaking, right? In the story of uh, the conclusion of the Montgomery bus boycott, we see performances of law testing, right? That is an attempt to see if the new Supreme Court ruling desegregating transit would actually hold. Uh, and finally, in the story of the Mississippi Freedom Vote, we see a, a massive, large-scale performance of legal subjectivity, right? An event where black voters affirm and claim rights of citizenship that are legally granted to them, but in practice have been denied. Um, so in each case, we find activists and organizers, many of them very young. I mean, most of the people that we're talking about here are under the age of 25. Um, and many of them with little formal education, harnessing the power of performance and rehearsal and role playing to dramatize the violation of their rights and to embody their claims to full citizenship. So on to the stories. Okay. So in spite of the fact that we know that many of the big events of the civil rights movement, the sit-ins, for example, were, um, were planned in advance, um, even sort of scripted and staged for television audiences. There's one big event um, that's erroneously remembered over and over as a spontaneous act, and that is the story of Rosa Parks. Right? I, I was certainly taught this story as a child. Rosa Parks was this tired old lady, and she just wanted to sit down and rest her feet, and she afforded herself this bit of comfort in the uh, whites-only section of the Montgomery City bus, and then kind of inadvertently kicked off uh, one of the most successful civil rights campaigns in modern history. Um, we know that this is not true, <laughs> and yet it hangs on, which I have some sort of theories about that. Maybe we can talk about that during Q&A. So first of all, we know she was not old. <laughs> she was 42. Um, and we also know that she was extremely politically active. Uh, she was the secretary of, uh, of her local NAACP branch, um, and she was also very active as an anti-rape activist um, uh, and in sort of sexual violence fields in general. So the fact of the matter is that Parks planned to break the law, and she did so as part of a broader network of activists who were strategically planning to break the law all over the South. So then the question is, well, how did she plan to do this? How did she prepare to do this? So shortly before her famous 1955 action of sitting on the bus, uh, Parks attended the Highlander Folk School. Um, do people here have some familiarity with the Highlander Folk School? Is this familiar? Some yes, some no. Okay, so Highlander Folk School, which now um, it continues to exist, uh, in Tennessee, um, the Cumberland Plateau, sort of mountains of Tennessee, um, is an adult education center. And it was founded in 1932, 32, uh, by Miles Horton. Uh, and this is a place that, when it was initially founded, was uh, very much focused on supporting uh, labor activism and labor 
organizing um, in the Appalachians in particular and in the local communities um, surrounding the center in Tennessee. Um, and so people would come from throughout the South. They would come for sort of two week uh, residencies or courses uh, during which they would learn um, about how to organize a union, uh, how to uh, give a political speech, how to raise money for your cause, right? All of these very sort of concrete political courses. Uh, at the same time, there were also um, cultural courses that were offered. Um, a lot of these were about preserving the indigenous traditions of the Tennessee mountains. Um, crafts, arts and crafts, music, dance, uh, and also dramatics, what they call dramatics courses. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm quite interested in all of these, but especially the dramatics. Um, and the dramatics program was founded by a woman named Zilphia Horton. Uh, she's a fascinating person. Uh, and in the dramatics program, she really made use of these role-playing exercises. She probably learned about them from an Austrian psychiatrist, of all people, uh, J.L. Moreno, who had come to the U.S., um, and was beginning to use these exercises as a therapeutic tool with his patients. Uh, and uh, she began to see their social uh, applicability. So um, there were role-playing exercises, there were improvisations, there were skits. You know, they weren't rehearsing scenes of Shakespeare. Um, it was about using the expertise of, of everyday people who were all amateurs Right, and using the tools of the theater to explore their problems and improvise solutions. So they would, for example, role play an AFL-CIO meeting. <laughs> um, and then they would take these skills back home. Uh, Horton, just as an aside, is it's just, she's so interesting to me because she, uh, because she was the wife of the founder, she actually escaped a lot of the scrutiny that the rest of the staff was facing from the FBI. Um, so if anybody here is interested in researching this period of history, get the FBI files uh, on, on the topic or the person or the place that you're looking into because they're filled with amazing information, right? And if you can sort of like dig through the, the bias <laughs> that's there, um, it's an incredible resource for what was happening and how people were sort of being understood. Um, so, you know, they thought, oh, she's just the wife and she's doing these, these kind of recreational cultural courses, um, but they were in fact quite infused with a lot of political content. Um, and I think I have another slide here, right? So here's just a, an example of the way Highlander and its attendees were being watched. This is actually a billboard that went up in Tennessee in the 50s, um, you know, showcasing Martin Luther King's uh, attendance at the school and, and labeling it a communist training school was, um, was very much uh, part of, um, part of the, 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 the attempts to undermine it um, as an institution where by the 50s a lot of interracial organizing was taking place in the rural South. Um, so they were being watched quite closely. And after World War II, Highlander shifts its focus from labor organizing to civil rights organizing. Um, this is when people like King start showing up, people like Parks, other people, right? So here, you know, here's a kind of <laughs> greatest hits photo, right? We have Martin Luther King, Pete Seeger, Cheris Horton, who's the daughter of the founders, Rosa Parks, and Ralph Abernathy, all at the uh, 25th uh, sort of anniversary celebration of the school in 1957. Uh, and the work that they're doing in, at Highlander in the 50s, um, you know, there, there is a lot of political training um, and activist training that's taking place. But what's also so radical about it, I think, is the kind of sociability that's being fostered between um, black and white allies, right? So even though they're apparently on the same side, right? They're working for the same causes. In daily life throughout the South, they don't get to sit down and have a meal together, right? They don't actually have to talk it out. There are a lot of conversations that are happening, um, uh, you know, behind racial lines, so to speak, right? Rather than across them. And Highlander is a place where this can happen. 
Um, the school was actually shut down uh, for a short time period by the FBI, sort of, um, they were in a dry county and there was a kind of trumped up liquor law violation that they um, exploited to shut them down. But really what stimulated the shutdown was a photograph, which I, I don't have, I wish I did, but a photograph of um, a white woman and a black man dancing together at a square dance. You know, just sort of recreational fun activity that was happening there. Um, and this just made everyone wild um, and resulted in the closure uh, of, of the center for some time. Uh, so there's a certain kind of sociability that's being facilitated through the life of Highlander, but also through these kinds of cultural courses that people would take together. Um, and so Rosa Parks is there in 1955, about three or four months before she goes back to, to Montgomery to sit on the bus um, and taking part in a lot of these trainings. So that's sort of one avenue through Highlander um, where the, the training in nonviolence is coming from. Um, another avenue is through CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, and I'll talk about that now. So this is the Montgomery story. Uh, this is a story that happens at the end of the full year boycott that Parks's action uh, began. So uh, the boycott is coming to an end. The Supreme Court has ruled that uh, city transit, public transit uh, segregation is unconstitutional. So things are going to change in Montgomery. Hooray. This is wonderful news. Uh, and Martin Luther King realized that this was an extremely delicate and complicated moment. Uh, would black riders be welcomed onto the buses? How would whites respond? You know, the black citizens of Montgomery were jubilant at their success. This was a really hard year, um, and they had done it, and King was too. But he also worried um, quite a bit that defensive whites could be really inflamed by any uh, uh, sort of performance uh, or celebratory or valedictory, um, you know, any kind of celebrating that would that would happen. And of course, we can, you know, we can talk about and debate um, that point of view. But his point of view really was: this needs to happen in the least sort of emotionally charged way possible, because if violence resulted, that would just be used as an excuse to say, you see. Integrated public transit doesn't work in Montgomery. So he was really working to avoid that. And the way he worked to avoid that is by preparing people by using this sociodrama. This is sociodrama, the word that they use to describe their role plays. So King had learned about the sociodrama from his affiliates at CORE. Um, CORE, as many of you probably know, was founded here in Chicago in 1942. Um, this is an offshoot of a, a radical Christian pacifist uh, uh, group, and, uh, and it's an interracial group. Uh, and one of the, they are really the innovators of the sociodrama. Um, and the first sit-in, really, um, takes place here in Chicago uh, at the Jack Spratt Coffee House, which is on the south side, a few blocks from where the Obamas live, I'm told. Uh, and so... Um, this is where it begins to be refined, the sort of specific acting out or role playing of the event in advance of the event itself. So uh, not everyone thought that this kind of training was a good idea. Uh, even though role playing nonviolence was clearly effective in training young activists, some of the leaders were nervous that using these techniques would actually produce activists who were kind of insincere in what they were doing, right? If they were too practiced, if they were too rehearsed, then perhaps they would just be these automatons going through the motions and that the actual impact of the event would be lost. Um, but there were others, uh, like Richard Gregg, who's a, a very important theorist of nonviolence influenced by Gandhi, um, argued that that these role plays could actually enhance the inner commitment of the demonstrator, right? Could, could change the demonstrator from the inside out um, or from the outside in, right? By, by behaving in such a way, by behaving nonviolently, I too might become nonviolent in a more truthful way in my own life. Um, so again, we have this example of nonviolent, uh, or sort of rehearsals for nonviolence serving the movement, but also serving the people who are 
who are taking part in these events. Um, by virtue of their role playing, becoming King Hoped, more Christian, more loving, more nonviolent, more a part of what he called the beloved community. So, as the boycott is coming to an end, uh, King calls a mass meeting of the Montgomery Improvement Association. Um, and these events are chronicled by King himself uh, in his uh, book, Stride Toward Freedom, uh, but also in a less conventional source, uh, this comic called The Montgomery Story. Have people seen this before? It is amazing, and you can, they're around, you can, you can get your hands on one. If you know um, John Lewis's recent graphic novels, March, um, they're, they're, very, um, they're very much indebted, I mean, and Lewis has talked about this, indebted to this comic uh, that, uh, that was widely circulated um, right after the boycott ended. Um, so this was written with King's uh, sort of blessing, um, and it's in this comic um, this is like one of these sort of boons for researchers, right? Because you just, it's, it's so much fun, but there's also so much in there that's so rich. Um, and we can see how the sociodrama worked, how it helped prepare people for transit integration, how it transformed skeptics into real um, people who were extremely committed to nonviolence. So I just wanted to show you a couple little highlights from there. So one of the things that's striking about this comic is there's a narrator who speaks directly to the reader. He sort of breaks the frame. Here on the right, the, it's probably not big enough to see, but I'll read it. Call me Jones. My name doesn't matter, but my story's important for you as well as me. We're all caught up in it one way or another. And then a few pages later, we see King sort of deliberating how can we get ready for the day when blacks and whites will ride the buses together. And then in the second frame, we began to make preparations for what we would do when we got back on the buses. Things would be different. We acted it all out. And here we have King himself playing the bus driver. And he says, now I'm the bus driver. And Catherine here is coming aboard to pay her fare. And she's coming in through the front door, right? And we can see they're using chairs to sort of simulate the bus. Uh, and he says, move along there, get to the back of the bus. She says, thank you, Mr. Bus Driver, but the back is crowded. I think I'll take this empty seat here. Well, you're supposed to go to the back. And she thinks, and then there are these thought bubbles, and we see this sort of progression of thought bubbles throughout the frames. Um, and we see her thinking to herself, arguing won't help, I'll just keep quiet. Uh, and, and we watch the sort of the inner life of, of these uh, activists in training being played out. Uh, so here then the story moves to when it actually happened and we see the training in practice. On another bus, someone slapped a woman in another thought bubble. I could really wallop him, he's smaller than me, but I'm going to remember what Reverend King told me about peace and nonviolence. I'll just keep my hands clasped, that way there won't be any trouble. So we see the, the, the perception of these participants being altered. And the kind of you know, high point of this comes at the end where we come back to Jones, our narrator. And in this last frame here he says, if what happened here is a victory for anyone at all, it's for all Montgomery. We respect ourselves more and we know that the idea of love and nonviolence is spreading. I've thrown my gun away. It had gotten much too heavy for me ever to lift again. And early in the comic, we see him um, talking about his gun and how he needs to have his gun. And then by the end, he's getting rid of his gun because he's been transformed by these activities. So we can see in the Montgomery story, right, not only how the training plays out, but also how the training then alters the people who take part in it, people like Jones, who become real adherents to Gandhian nonviolence, right? So the publication of this comic and, and King's book, Stride Toward Freedom, really spread the word uh, far and wide about the sociodrama. And it began to be used widely in trainings, um, including in trainings for um, the sort of wave of sit-ins uh, that began in 1960 in Greensboro and Nashville and then spread throughout the South. Um, and we also have a lot of people still going to Highlanders, still participating there. So, um, so it's really uh, being used in all of these places. And it's at this moment in the early 1960s that we begin to see a kind of new way of thinking about role playing and rehearsal. 
um, a twist. Um, most of these events were very small scale, right? It's hard to imagine doing, you know, if you've ever done a role play exercise, you, ha you have to have kind of a limited number of people. Um, but then there was this attempt to scale it up. And this gets us to the third story, the 80,000 people that you've never heard of. Uh, so I'll just play a little clip to start us off. We have sound. So they're saying no more Barnett. And Barnett is Ross Barnett, who is the loathed uh, Dixiecrat governor, um, loathed by some, uh, of, of Mississippi, who was outgoing uh, at this rally uh, at the end of 1963. Um, you know, he was well known for, you know, planning to arrest the Freedom Riders, for blocking James Meredith's enrollment or attempting to block his enrollment at University of Mississippi, um, you know, defying federal authorities at, at every turn. Uh, so his departure was, was something to celebrate indeed. Um, and they were also celebrating uh, the departure of his uh, sort of heir apparent, his lieutenant governor, uh, Paul B. Johnson, who you see here confronting uh, James Meredith when he attempted to, uh, to enroll at Ole Miss in 1962. Um, so even if we haven't heard this clip before, it's like we kind of feel like we've heard it before, right? It's following, uh, you know, this is the sort of classic soundtrack of, of the civil rights movement. And, uh, and this is from a rally, an election night rally in November of 1963. Uh, and after the singing, the chanting, the sermons, and the speeches, uh, the new governor, uh, Reverend Aaron, uh, pardon me, Aaron Henry, who's a pharmacist, uh, head of the state NAACP from Clarksdale, Mississippi, and Ed King, Reverend Edwin King, uh, who is the white uh, chaplain of Tougaloo College, a historically black college uh, in Jackson, took the stage. Um, and the crowd celebrated the victory of the first integrated gubernatorial ticket since Reconstruction in Mississippi. Now, if you are a student of Mississippi history, or perhaps this just doesn't sound right to you. <laughs> There's a reason. Um, this didn't happen, right? They never became the governor and lieutenant governor. It was all a fiction. So in fact, who became governor? Paul B. Johnson, right? He did become the governor. He served a full four-year term. Um, he was just as bad as everybody feared um, when uh, James Cheney and Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, uh, three civil rights volunteers, went missing and were later found murdered. Uh, in Mississippi, his very unhelpful response was, well, maybe they went to Cuba, right? Sort of aligning, again, um, a sort of fear of uh, communist activity uh, with the civil rights activists. So, so then, so what is this, right? So what is this event? Um, this rally was part of uh, what's called the Freedom Vote, or sometimes it's called the Freedom Ballot. 
Uh, and this was a mock gubernatorial election that was held in Mississippi in 1963. So it had no officially recognized legal outcome. Um, but it was an absolutely enormous event. So during the course of the freedom vote, 80,000 black voters cast ballots, um, the vast, vast majority of them for this ticket. Uh, and just to put that number in context, 80,000, I just want to linger on that moment for a second, because 80,000 is an absolutely staggering number when you consider that the number of black voters who are registered in the entire state of Mississippi in 1963 is 20,000. So four times the number of actual registered voters are casting ballots in this election. And so when I first heard about this event, and it's, it's actually quite an embarrassing sort of teacher moment because a student sort of pointed to a footnote in a book and said, what is, what is this? <laughs> uh, what is this freedom vote? And I was like, well, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. Uh, and so this was many years ago, and I started looking into it, and I started, I was teaching at Yale at the time, and I asked my colleagues who were, you know, eminent civil rights historians, what is this? And maybe people knew a little bit about it, um, but most people didn't know much about it at all. So I became very interested, not only in the event itself, but why it had been so forgotten, right? How does something so big, 80,000 people, slip through the cracks. Um, and I have lots of thoughts about that, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later during Q&A. Um, but I propose that we understand this event in a couple of different ways. First, it's a performance of legal subjectivity, right? A kind of legal personhood um, that had been denied to black voters in Mississippi. Um, and second, that it too was another example of a kind of sociodramatic rehearsal, but this time on an extremely large scale, right? A rehearsal for a moment when voting would be easy, would be guaranteed and protected by the federal government. They didn't know when that moment was coming. Um, as a matter of fact, it was coming quite soon, but they didn't know it at the time. So the freedom vote represented a break in strategy uh, for activists in Mississippi after years of really, really grindingly difficult voter registration campaigns. Mississippi was thought of um, not without cause as a place where um, such, uh, to concentrate efforts on voter registration was just a waste of effort because it was so difficult. And a lot of the organizations like SCLC wanted to focus their efforts on places where it was more manageable, um, places like Georgia. Uh, and so, uh, they just, they like couldn't deal with Mississippi. It was too hard. But Robert Moses um, and other young volunteers from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Commission wanted to do something. So what they decided to do was this mock election. Um, and the campaign for the mock election, we have this ticket of uh, Henry and King and, and um, uh, Edwin King is still alive and I got to talk with him this summer, which was truly amazing. Um, and uh, they had a platform. And their, and their platform, you know, unsurprisingly calls for an end of segregation, particularly in terms of public facilities, um, the replacement of the State Sovereignty Commission, which was the sort of Mississippi Surveillance Society, it was sort of like the Mississippi FBI, truly terrifying, um, with a commission on equality, but also economic justice was a big part of their platform too, raising the minimum wage to $1.25, um, creating a jobs program, better schools. Uh, and so they, they did all the things that one does in a political campaign, right? They developed a platform, they gave speeches, um, they had uh, lots of volunteers, and voters and potential voters became very practiced in things like wearing buttons and filling out registration forms, raising money, going door to door to campaign. Um, all of these sort of embodied practices um, that go along with taking part um, in an election uh, that, that very few black Mississippians had ever gotten to take part in before. Uh, they set up polling places in churches. Um, the polling actually took place over three days, one of which included a Sunday, so that it could be part of a church service um, for pastors who were, who were willing to include that. Uh, and they, they used churches, they used community centers, they used schools, places where voters felt relatively safe, relatively comfortable. 
Um, they also used vote mobiles, so they had cars <laughs> that would drive around from sort of rural town to rural town, and people could come cast their ballots, you know, at the car, and then the car would drive off to the, to the next town. So all of this is creating a kind of embodied repertoire of practices, right, that can be repeated when the moment is right. Um, and I think many of us probably have just absorbed these embodied practices of voting without even really thinking about it, right? I have very vivid memories of going into the polling booths with my parents when I was a child, right, and watching them fill out the form and maybe I would get to pull the lever, you know, if I, if I was lucky. So, um, you know, so many of us, I think, have absorbed these practices, but there was this recognition that it had to be done in a very concrete way in Mississippi. Um, you know, especially when voting for the first time, I think even under the best of circumstances can be kind of a stressful situation. Um, to remove some of that fear, um, to teach people um, about how to exercise their rights, but also about how good it felt to do that. Um, I mean, which like people didn't need to be taught that, but there was also this sense of safety in numbers, right, if everybody was doing it. Um, so, you know, who are the volunteers? After a lot of debate, the Freedom Vote organizers uh, enlisted white college students in their efforts. Um, and this was very controversial. This is before the Freedom Summer, um, when that happened on a large scale. Um, there were a lot of people who resisted the um, arrival of college students because there was a real uh, strong uh, drive to set up an indigenous grassroots leadership campaign. Um, at the same time, here's a poster. At the same time, the presence of the students did bring some national attention to uh, what was happening there, as you can see here in this New York Times article. Um, so what is being dramatized? Uh, you know, it is this new relationship to the law. Uh, and participants were aware um, of the theatrical qualities of their action. Uh, an editorial in the Mississippi Free Press said, Perhaps it would be wise to remember then that this vote is not merely a protest, but also a rehearsal for a better government. It is a rehearsal for the state as a public convenience. And its single irony rests in its superiority to the official vote. And so there's a lot of humor, uh, actually, that pervades these discourses around the freedom vote, and, and this pointing out of how ironic it is, right, that this is actually a much better system than the one that's legally recognized. Um, at the same time, uh, it was rarely acknowledged that the vote was a fiction. Um, so in all of the sort of materials, um, you never see a disclaimer like, these people won't actually be elected governor. Um, you know, in, these, in, the, in the registration forms. It mimicked the official one in every way. So uh, they were aware, but I think one of the radical things about the freedom vote is that it makes a mockery of the legitimate structure, right? It uses the mock of the mock election to make a mockery of, um, you know, a system that's been deemed legitimate but actually disenfranchises thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, and it was leading to something actually. Um, one of the things it was leading towards was the uh, formation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and their attempted um, seating at the Democratic National Convention in 1964. Uh, and there's another picture of that too. Uh, so where does this leave us? Um, what can we take away from thinking about these stories of rehearsal and role play that show this new relationship to the law being imagined? Um, there's a, this may seem like a weird place to go at this moment, but the, there's a great Russian acting teacher uh, named Konstantin Stanislavsky, and one of his contributions to acting theory, the way he taught his actors, um, was this phrase he used called the magic if. And the magic if is something that the actor does to imagine her way into circumstances that she herself has not experienced. Um, and how one might feel or might behave in such circumstances. Um, and I think we see there's a kind of magic ifness involved in, um, in a lot of these activities, but it's not magic, right? It's very practical, um, it's very thought through, 
Uh, and it's an act of faith, right, that such rehearsals could yield um, this new relationship to the law um, that, they're, that they're imagining, right? And using the imagination, I think, to temporarily inhabit this different world, um, a world where the promise of citizen, right, is available equally to all people, is the sort of lasting legacy uh, that, that these events leave us. And we actually see them being used today um, in other scenarios, um, which I can talk about, but I think it's time to turn to you for your questions. So I'll stop there and say thank you very much. All right, Kate is running around with a microphone, so. I don't think I need the microphone. In mid-August of 1965, perhaps you can fill in a gap in my own history memory. Um, in mid-August of 1965, my brother's roommate in seminary, Jonathan Daniels, was murdered. And I had always thought it was the Selma March, but of course it wasn't because mm. this was August, maybe the 20, 21st, 22nd of 65. Mm -hmm. Would you know what March that was? I don't know. Do you know where? I think in Mississippi, but I'm not sure. That's a really, uh, being able to sort of instantly pull these dates is not my, my greatest expertise. I, I don't know. I, there was, you know, Meredith, James Meredith, um, around that time had a march um, um, that was quite similar to the Selma March, a long distance march that took place throughout the state of Mississippi, um, uh, which was not covered widely in the press, but there, there were acts of violence, and I, and I believe that, that one or two people, unfortunately, were killed. Um, but I, you know, was you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think other people in the audience might know better than me on this one. Yeah. But we could look it up, and if we maybe we can talk afterward. I bet I could do a little scouting around for you. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the back there. Kate gets to decide. <laughs> she has the mic. The um, freedom vote is an amazing story. Uh, but I'm trying to imagine the environment in which this took place. These blacks were inhabiting a different world, mm -hmm. but what was going on around them in terms of the white community? Did they view this as, oh, they're just playing around, they're making this up, or what was the reaction of the white community to this vote? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, and it's, um, it's one that I've, that I've really struggled with in my, um, in my own research. Um, because it's it's hard um, it's hard to, to find the answer. This is one of the reasons I think that we don't know about it. Um, it is not widely covered in the mainstream press. Uh, I think for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, that it is threatening. Um, Eighty thousand, you know, perhaps not incidentally, was about the gap um, in the final tally of the election between Phillips, uh, Rubel Phillips, the GOP challenger, and Paul B. Johnson. So there was this understanding um, that, uh, that the black vote could, could really move Mississippi electoral politics, and that was not something that the white mainstream press really wanted to report on. Um, so I think some people did understand. I think other people didn't quite know how to handle it, and they said, well, this is just, just a protest, just another protest. Um, it's not gonna have any you know, real world outcome. But a lot of the volunteers faced exactly the same kind of violence and um, harassment um, that the voter registration volunteers did, Be people being the vote mobiles, being run off the road, um, people being jailed under you know, sort of trumped up charges. So there was a sense that this, that this was a danger um, to a broader system of white supremacy, but there was also, I think, some confusion about what to, what to make of it, exactly. This will be our last question. Oh, no. So, um, you make a really good point about performance and, and rehearsal and trying to mobilize a movement. Do you see that same sense of rehearsal in other aspects of American history, like the Boston Tea Party, let's say, mm -hmm. or, uh, or earlier, maybe the abolition movement when uh, 
William Lloyd Garrison and others were trying to organize. Where do you see performance appearing preceding what you've been talking about, which by the way is really compelling and really interesting? Thank you. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a wonderful way to think about American history. Um, and a lot of scholars um, in, in American studies and performance studies have been doing just that. Um, I think the Boston Tea Party is a great example. I always use this with my students. Um, some of you might be familiar with the work of Phil Deloria, uh, who wrote a wonderful book called Playing Indian. Uh, and he thinks about uh, this moment where the Sons of Liberty disguise themselves as Indians um, in order to toss the tea right into the harbor. Um, but what's often not discussed is that everybody knew who they were. Right? These were not great disguises. So we think about, <laughs> we think about disguise as like, oh, I'm going to conceal my identity so that I won't be discovered. That is not what this was about. So they would just like throw a blanket over their shoulders and be like, now I'm an Indian. So, so then what, but what is that about, right? Why inhabit this Indian identity if it's not to conceal your identity? So what is it about? indigenous Americans that were so appealing to the Sons of Liberty that they wanted to play that role um, in order to distinguish themselves from the British, right? So, so American history is filled with these stories of performance being deployed in order to secure a certain kind of American identity um, or to uh, counter certain American traditions deemed you know, unjust. Um, and we see it today too. I mean, in, you know, I live in St. Louis, and we've act, I've seen so much of this um, rehearsal, um, sort of on an upswing in, in uh, grassroots activism in the last year in St. Louis. So it's still with us. I'm so sorry that more of you had questions that we didn't get to talk about, but um, I will stay out here, um, and hopefully I can I can talk to all of you. So please do come and introduce yourself to me. Thank you very much. Thank you.